Listen. We both lived through one war. Let's not start another. Too many people have died already. We can resolve this without more bloodshed. Please, do this for your people. With a name like the Solitary Clone, it was always going to be a case of a kid in the candy shop scenario, as there was an abundance of troopers fans would like to see at this point, but none bigger than one-time movie star and Clone Wars part-timer, Cody. And thankfully, we didn't have to wait long. This episode truly acts as a nice dose of nostalgia whilst advancing the running narrative of the clones struggling to find any identity in this newly formed empire, other than being the threshold that the TK troopers are inevitably going to cross. Knock knock! Who's there? <laughs> that door! This episode truly taps into the emotional nuances that I have certainly been wanting to see for some time, and I feel a lot of the fan base have been yearning for as well. Mark! Mark! Something we only got teasers of in the season one with Hauser and Gregor. If there was ever an episode to be thrown into the category for top contender of season two, and possibly the bad batch so far, this was absolutely one for the books. The visual parallels, callbacks, messaging, and contextual elements to make this such a heavy instalment without delivering any unnecessary aspects was refined and a visual experience that I'll take with me for some time. Everything was deliberate in what it wanted to convey to the audience, down to them naming some of the background clones just to tap into the emotional resonance that people have with them. I will force you two to grieve properly, even if it kills us all! I have a lot more that I want to discuss regarding this episode, so before I get too far into it, let's give you a rundown of events. We open on the vibrant world of Desix, a new system introduced here that bears similarities to some of the mining worlds we've seen in Star Wars, like Raxus Prime or Kessel, where we are introduced to a new Imperial Governor, Governor Groton, who has been sent to replace the current world governor, Twani Ames. Twani outrightly dismisses this, stating that Desix separated from the Republic long before the Clone Wars finished, and demands to be acknowledged as an independent system and remain as such going forward. When Groton threatens to act against them, Twani reveals a squadron of battle droids that have them surrounded as part of her armed guard. Cut to Coruscant, where we see Crosshair is waking up, and before his day can begin, he continues to be rejected by his brothers and is called to Rampart's office, where Rampart begins playing 20 questions and wants to understand why Crosshair returned to the Imperial Army. Crosshair states that he believes that this is his responsibility, and we are informed here that Crosshair was stuck on Kamino for roughly a month following the events of Kamino's destruction. Rampart confirms he's been cleared medically to return to action, but will no longer be in command. He's being sent in under the guise of a diplomatic proceedings, but wants the insurgency dealt with on Desix. It's here that it's revealed that Commander Cody will now be the acting command for Crosshair. After a brief discussion of purpose and life itself, they make their way to Desix, where they their ship is taken out by a competent droid, and once they've crashed, the fight begins. Round one, fight! Cody, alongside Crosshair, Nova, Wyler, and a couple other troopers are the only survivors from the crash, and proceed to the capital. It's here where the fun begins, and we see some of the displays of badassery that made the clones as impressive as they are throughout the Clone War. As they scale the levels of the city, we get to see the invasion take place in a heavily restrictive environment, just bringing us into the action a little closer as we get some close-up shots and the tight surroundings leave it open for the men's demise, as the droids can locate them easily in overwhelming numbers. After losing all their men, Cody and Crosshair bulldoze their way through the various commando droids crawling all over the stairwell up to the tower, with no compunction about being impolite. They make it to Twani's position, and as Cody tries to reason with her, she clarifies that she doesn't doesn't believe in the sentiment of peace anymore, after putting forth a bill of peace back in the Clone Wars Season 3 alongside Mina Bonteri. Upon its rejection and seeing what transpired after, she gave up on the very idea of peace. Cody manages to break through to her, appealing to her better sensibilities, but Crosshair undoes this by killing her moments later under Groton's instruction, providing an insight to his position in all this. God fucking damn it! Cody looks visibly dejected by this, and full of remorse going forward. Sometime later, there's a brilliant visual piece of storytelling where we see the remnants of the clones and Cody in hand being escorted off-world in one ship, while the TK troopers begin to flood the lands in droves. That is one big pile of shit. 
Once they arrive back on Coruscant, Cody questions what the point of this all is and whether they're truly serving a good purpose. Crosshair is called back to Rampart the next day and it's revealed that Cody has gone AWOL and he's being redeployed for now under the new command of CC1226. Who? I can't find any troopers right now matching that designation just yet but I'd be interested to see who it is. Rampart then proceeds to chastise Crosshair in this moment by reminding him that every clone that serves under him keeps disappearing. This seems to hit Crosshair a little bit and we close on him leaving his office. When Star Wars fans want more content and context, this is what they mean and deserve. Truly, there's a lot to be explored during this portion of the timeline, and thankfully we've had titles like Fallen Order, Kenobi, and Rebels that have followed things from the Jedi and Rebels perspective, while titles like Andor have approached this from a more political standpoint, but Bad Batch is taking closer inspection at the remnants of the Clone War and what became of them. It's fascinating to see the direction that they're headed with the various elements involved right now, and there are times when you need episodes like this that remove themselves from the explosive, comedic adventures and throw you into the thick of it with all the nuances to boot. Crosshair was the biggest wildcard coming out of Season 1, and many wanted to know what would become of him going forward after rejecting his brothers, and I personally don't mind the answer that we got. There's a degree of determination to Crosshair that you could say is concerning, but I'm curious about why. After everything, with his brothers leaving and now Cody departing, he's still so determined to serve the Empire, when he can see the atrocities that the clones are being forced to commit. Well, the kid's got a point. It's a psychologist's dream. The fundamental of Crosshair is just servitude, I think, and a desire to continue the only existence he's ever known. So maybe there's an element of fear in here of what would become of him if he left, but it is very concerning to see what will happen to him going forward and what part he'll play in the Empire's game. To continually pair him with troopers as well that seemingly bite back against the Order in the likes of Hauser, his own crew, Gregor, and now Cody, must be beating him down. And by the end, we can only hope that he accepts this and turns against the Empire too. The clones are being phased out, and right now, he's not in a guaranteed spot to be kept around. You get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! It's telling as well that he still wants to be close, even without knowing it. He deliberately sat at the table with other troopers at the beginning of the episode, but they still rejected him. Likely due to any conflict that they had during the war, or a natural bias because he doesn't look like them in a conventional sense. Cut to a clone that is done with all this shit. Commander Cody. I am sick. I am sick, sick, sick of your shit. And when I'm not sick, I'm tired. I am sick and tired. A trooper that people have had questions over since Revenge of the Sith. Cody is already acknowledging the degrees of separation between him and the Empire, and I would assume that he's only stuck with it till now, believing this to be their truth, but by the end rejects the New Galactic Order. Cody was the best choice to bring in for this, as he clearly maintains a steady rationale over the situation, and feels a degree of remorse when mentioning the Jedi, and probably reflecting on his actions against Obi-Wan. And by the end, after having a discussion and defusing a hostile situation with Twani, all of his actions failed him, as the Empire still took that away. To see the attempts at camaraderie from Cody was heartbreaking as well, as he's longing for how things used to be, and isn't taking this transition easily, regardless of what he's telling himself and others. The visual parallels to the Bad Batch arc and the Clone Wars was awesome, as we didn't get to see Cody actually fight alongside them in that. That went to Rex after making repeated references to their close connections then. So to see this here and the potential they had as a unified unit was awesome. Going forward, he could be a huge support for someone like Rex and trying to locate other clones. Another interesting development to this is where there are still systems in the galaxy operating without any affiliation, and to see what becomes of them going forward is a stark reminder of the power the Empire possesses, even if portions of their military right now are defecting. To see the droids again was a delight too. They appear to have received a visual upgrade that distinguishes them somewhat from their previous installments in The Clone Wars and Bad Batch, however it does draw them a bit closer to their movie counterparts, and the commando droids especially looked a little more menacing. It's also interesting to see that they're still active right now. I am curious to know if this was similar to the Kalani situation in Rebels, where they ignored the shutdown order, or if there's just a simple case that they're reprogrammed here. The various means in how Crosshair dealt with the droids felt like the Crossy of old, that just slotted comfortably back into the battlefield position and he felt like himself again with a new coat of paint. 
The deliberate naming of Nova and Wyla was done in a way to pull on those heartstrings, as Filoni knows the love that the fanbase has for the clones at this point, and even though they're the enemy to the galaxy right now, audiences around the world are struggling to make that disconnect. In terms of the general direction and creation of this episode, the score that was used for it was incredible, utilising light motifs as well of the clone theme used repeatedly throughout the series, and it was great to invoke that nostalgic feeling. In terms of the actual environment, the claustrophobic settings work well for tension and played out with a reminiscent feeling to imagery that you'd see from real world wars. The composition and environments were incredible. Visually, this episode was on another level, with the appearance of Desix and the textures really popped. The visual representations were good as well, and like I mentioned previously, with the remnants of the clones being carted out and the TK troopers being brought in, it was a stark reminder of where this is headed. Leaving off, the last little things I'd like to talk about is the mention of Twani's involvement during the Bill of Peace extended to the Republic back in Season 3 of The Clone Wars. They don't have to make little connections like this, but it makes episodes like this even more vital as they provide context for later and back to those moments and offer up more impact for characters involved. The other big questions going forward for sure is, is there a chance of redemption for Crosshair and what becomes of Cody? Regarding Crosshair, he committed the order to eliminate Twani under Groton's instruction with little to no hesitation. I would assume there is, given his reaction to Rampart's reminder that he's always alone by the end of his missions, even when he has people around him, but I can't say for sure. I'd like to believe there's still a little hope for him, but right now, I'm not seeing it. As for Cody, I think he knew he would be in deep waters had he stayed. It was the smartest move for him to leave, and it leaves room open for him to come back potentially down the line, and to see what he could do involved with Rex. I love this one as it's almost an intellectual study into the likes of Crosshair and Cody, and offers up a truest answer to who the solitary clone is at the end of this, and the answer is... all of them, having to live with the choices that they're making regardless of the consequences. And individuals like Cody starting to step out of that light, and truly become themselves is where we're going to start paying witness to the clone uprising. They're beginning to die out, and regardless of Rex's efforts to try and rescue them, it seems unlikely that many right now put a make body it out in the this. square. Hey! Don't you ever say that again! As a visual contrast to what we've seen and understood of the clones for so long, this was a necessary dose of reality, and being able to pay witness to the shift in the Imperial regime was brilliantly executed in this episode. Out of all the Bad Batches episodes so far, this was definitely one of the highlights, and I would absolutely recommend that you go out of your way to watch it. Do it! That's gonna do it for now though, thanks for dropping by. Leave a like, and if you're interested on in hearing more from me, subscribe. Until next time though, take care, and may the Force be with you all.